Hello and uh, good morning uh, or good evening and welcome to the United Nations uh, General Assembly Science Summit, uh, the session on Japan and uh, the session titled Valuing Value, how any organization can measure stakeholder values and ethical capitalism. Before I uh, go into the credits for who is organizing these, I would like to make an important uh, announcement about this session. Uh, first of all, this session is in both Japanese and English. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided in both languages. To access this feature, um, look at the bottom of your screen for the meeting controls and click on the icon near the right hand corner that looks like a globe, then click the language that you would like to hear. The original language will still be audible at 20% of the volume with the interpreted language at 80%. To hear the interpreted language only, click mute original audio. It もう一つは残りは日本語で言いますけれども、このセッションは日本語と英語で行われます。で、えー、日本語と英語の同時通訳が提供されます。で、通訳機能をご利用される方は、スクリーン下の方のミーティングコントロールをご覧ください。えー、右側にある地球儀のアイコンをクリックし、えー、お聞きになりたい言語をクリックしてください。オリジナルの言語、もともとの言語は 20% の音量で、通訳言語は 80% の音量で聞こえます。通訳言語のみを聞く場合は、オリジナル音声をミュートにするをクリックしてください。ということなので、えー、日本語と英語のどちらかを皆さんあのお選びください。Anyway, so,、um, first of all,、uh, this session is organized by the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, with the support from the Permanent Mission of Japan at the United Nations、mm -hmm. and in collaboration with the Value Research Center at Doshisha University and also the ESG Integration、uh, Research and Education Center at the Osaka School of International Public Policy, Osaka University. And my name is Haruko Sato at the Osaka School of International Public Policy. I am today's MC and moderator, and it is a great honor for me to be this、uh, to be moderating this session, which is comprised of roughly uh, three uh, components.、Uh, one which starts with、uh, Professor Philip Sugai, the first speaker,、uh, talking about his value model,、uh, which is a rather、uh, revolutionary、uh, measuring model for、uh, sort of how well you do with SDG ESG scoring. Um, and uh, but the other, and then it will be followed by a, a fireside chat, and then、uh, with、uh, both a、uh, Philip and and with、uh, for, uh, Ambassador and Professor Hoshino、uh, Toshia, who is also who is from the Osaka School of International Public Policy and also the founder of the ESG、uh, Integration Research and Education Center. Uh, and as I promise you, that this will be, and then we will go, so, excuse me, and then this will be followed by、um, another、uh, session with uh, uh, seven speakers who will be each speaking from very different perspectives about SDGs and ESGs and how we can sort of、uh, better address、uh, some of the pending problems in tackling not just climate change, but also、uh, for making a better. Uh, world for all. So these are all sort of global challenges, but、um, I, we will be looking at both from an academic, philosophical, and business perspective. So we promise you to be full of ideas, insights, and inspiration, and lots and lots of idealism. So,、um, these ears, I can't have the other ears. Yeah. No, no, I was only making sure it was that loud. I think you need to mute somebody, mute. Heather, I think we can hear you. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So,、um, and then after the, the, the presentations,、uh, we will be having a panel discussion with all the speakers that you've previously heard. 
And I hope that this will be a very meaningful and stimulating discussion for all of you, the panelists, as well as the audience. We would also try to incorporate as many sort of questions or comments we may you may have from the audience. And so for all the questions or comments, please post on the chat room. But um, for, for sake of, uh, it we would appreciate if you would uh, keep just to the chat room and not address um, individual speakers with uh, individual questions. So that would be very much appreciated. So um, without further ado, I would like to turn the microphone and the screen to Professor Philip Sugai from the Deutsche Business, Business School, who's the founder of uh, the Value Research Center. Please, Philip. Great. Thank you very much, Haruko, uh, for the great introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Sugai, and I am the director of the Value Research Center here in Kyoto, Japan. And I'm very, very happy all of you are here today to listen to our session on uh, valuing value, how any organization can measure stakeholder value and ethical capitalism. Uh, and so basically, um, uh, what I'd like to do just first off is say thank you uh, personally uh, to the organizers at the United Nations General Assembly Science Summit, uh, Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations, and also uh, to uh, OIST, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and spe specifically uh, Heather Nyson for all of your fantastic help and for Heather for inviting me uh, and this uh, team to present today. So, and I think we've already covered some of these notes. So let me uh, again, uh, jump in. Uh, Haruko has also covered the agenda uh, with our speakers and I'm really looking forward to uh, the discussions that are going to flow uh, from this whole event. But let me start off just by um, introducing you to a little bit of the work that we've been doing and sort of the foundation of the discussions that I hope we can have going forward. So I've been teaching uh, marketing to global MBA students for more than uh, 20 years, about two decades. And I've noticed a trend putting me and basically any other professor who's teaching in a business school, uh, specifically marketing at the center of a really troubling issue. And so you can see from these uh, um, news clippings that I've recently taken, Marketing, advertising seems to be at the very um, center of uh, some of the major issues that the world is suffering from, because the way that marketing was taught when I was in business school and marketing to be successful back then meant that you would sell a lot of different products to a lot of different people. Um, but because of that, we're sort of living with the results of that way of thinking. So um, basically, as a professor of marketing in 2022 and hopefully beyond, um, something definitely needs to change. So um, in terms of that perspective, uh, the American Marketing Association sensed this issue back in 2004, actually, and they actually changed the definition of what marketing is. Um, they've changed it again three short years after um, to this definition that if you Google right now definition of marketing, AMA, which is the American Marketing Association, which the name says American, but it really is a global association and membership organization for marketing executives, researchers uh, around the world. It says that marketing is the activity, it's the set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging things that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. So you can see right at the heart of this definition, this doesn't talk about selling more stuff anymore. It talks about creating value. Um, and so these words sound very nice, but the question that I have is, well, is this in line with the definition of truly what a good company is? And so in order to get an answer, people typically go back to Milton Friedman uh, and his 1970s uh, article in the New York Times Magazine talking about this idea that an executive uh, in a company can be good and only good if they make as much money as possible while conforming to the basic rules of society, right? Uh, and so with that definition, 
uh, basically that puts the executive and the firm that they work for and shareholders who are the owners of the company and getting the results of those profits as the primary responsibility of marketers, business people in general, and then all other stakeholders become external, right? They're externalities. They're beyond our scope and they're, they're deprioritized. So there actually is a different way though. And um, there is a more ethical pro approach to capitalism that does have its roots in Asia. And um, for those of you unfamiliar with the Asian region or Japan itself, um, Japan um, originally or early on got a significant amount of um, uh, education and, and insight from Confucian principles. And at the heart of the Analects of Confucius um, basically is this idea that um, this pursuit of profit um, is not the direct or end result that we should be aiming at. Um, and so you can see a couple of quotes here from the Analects where basically um, the idea that profits are not wonderful, especially excessive profits, are fairly clear. And this way of thinking had a significant impact uh, on thinking in Japan. And in fact, um, early on or during um, the period of the samurai here in Japan, merchants in the social order of things were very, very low in the social structure. And that led to someone like Ishida Baigan uh, back in the early 1700s, arguing for this idea of fair profits are okay, actually. Yes, we understand from the Analects and from the teaching there that profits may not be great, but there's a line, there's a distinction between fair profit and excessive profit. So based on that, actually, and, and sort of almost at the same time, ideas out of Shiga Prefecture, it was called Omi uh, back then, um, started with the Omi Shonen, these Omi merchants, who had this philosophy of the three goods. It's called Sampo Yoshi. So in order for a business to be good, not only does it have to be good for the buyer and good for the seller, it also has to be good for society. And this way of thinking has actually been at the heart of many Japanese businesses since then. And I'm not sure if you've seen news like this um, uh, pop up uh, recently, but um, again and again, I'm seeing news articles where they're highlighting the fact that businesses in Japan uh, include some of the oldest ones in the world. In fact, 56% of the companies that are 200 years old or older in the world are here in Japan. And there's more than 33,000 businesses that are at least, at least 100 years old. And this is right from the BBC uh, a couple of years ago. But the idea is, if you've got that social focus, if that ethical approach to business of not going after excessive profits, of actually trying to find a social good, if, that, if that's at the core, then it makes sense that these businesses can be sustainable in a longer term or in a diff different use of the word that we hear recent or usually right now in that sustainability over the long term makes sense because we're taking care of all of our different stakeholders as we actually continue over the long term. So very recently, 2019, the business roundtable that had defined the purpose of a business based on Milton Friedman's uh, arguments actually changed the definition of what a business is in business for in 2019. And they clearly state that the purpose of a business now is to create value or to do good for the firm itself, its customers, employees, partners, society, the planet, and shareholders. So they mentioned these seven stakeholder groups. Again, Davos Manifesto 2020, Charles Schwab from the World Economic Forum, also arguing for these same exact seven stakeholders. So the rest of the world is catching up to the 17th, 1700s uh, thinking that got its start in Japan. And so I've published a book recently talking about uh, seven directions of value, so nanaho yoshi. Um, and it's all great, um, but I have some of the best students in the world uh, in my classes and executives that I teach also this idea or thinking usually come up to me and say, okay, professor, this all sounds great, but how do we actually measure that value that you're talking about, right? It's a nice word, but how do we measure it? 
And that actually is exactly what Milton Friedman said back in 1970. If you read his article, and it's a fantastic article to read, um, even in 2022, uh, it says, he said that the discussions of social responsibilities of business are notable for their analytical looseness and lack of rigor. So um, basically, he's saying that um, we can talk about social impact and value and all these things, but they're notorious for not having any rigor behind them. So um, that's led me to actually coin a term called value washing. We've all heard this idea of greenwashing, where a company will talk about its environmental benefits when maybe or maybe not uh, they're doing those things that they say. But now when we're in the world of the sustainable development goals, we're looking at all of those different stakeholders uh, that we're seeing uh, coming up with the Business Roundtable, World Economic Forum. Um, this is when companies are actually talking about value for employees or value for society or value for partners or customers, and actually similar to greenwashing, not backing them up with the actual actions behind them. So what I've found in the research that I've done is the way to value wash is to avoid giving clear goals for what you say. Don't provide any objective measures for these goals. Avoid transparency at all costs. Don't use any objective third-party feedback loops. And what we're seeing, especially in the conversations around sustainability today, is that there's so much complexity. It's, it seems as if it's built to be complex so that individual businesses, solo entrepreneurs, small medium enterprises can't actually participate in sustainability efforts. So if we're going to come up with some solution for these, we need to have that rigor um, that uh, Milton Friedman was saying was so lacking. And unfortunately, what my research is showing that all the discussions around stakeholder capitalism today are actually giving value washing superpowers. And it's something that I'm hoping as a professor of marketing and branding and those things to actually help try to change. So if we value wash, anyone who, um, faces risks from not actually seeing the real impacts that businesses are making. So these people who um, need to see the truth are being robbed of seeing the actual impacts as they're happening. This includes investors, policymakers, company leaders, individual stakeholders themselves. And my feeling is irrespective of where they stand in terms of their beliefs or their politics, you don't want to be supporting something that actually turns out to be against the things that you are believing with or trying to do. And so I think that goes across, uh, across beliefs, across politics. So if we can't see the impacts, we really don't understand the full reality of business operations and the risks associated with that. So my question to start off all of this research was, are there any, are, is there an analytically tight and rigorous set of measurements of multi-stakeholder value that can truly measure the value that the AMA, the Business Roundtable, and the World Economic Forum, amongst others, talk about? Can we measure this value holistically across all stakeholders in a clear and consistent way and avoid value washing entirely when we do so? So first, let me just introduce you to a number of my uh, terrible mistakes. Um, first was back in 2016, I had the bright idea that we could collect all of the academic articles that were written about value measurement, collect um, all of the formula, and actually figure out a way to merge them together into one macro model, one meta model for value measurement. And so I had more than 10 uh, MBA students working with me over these three years. We went through hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of academic articles. We narrowed them down to 156 that truly had measurements of value, formulas, variables that we could understand and ways to analyze. But when we tried to put them together, just the statistics didn't work. People were measuring value from different perspectives. They were using different formula. They were using different analytics tools. So it just didn't work. And so this first attempt actually turned out to be an outright failure. So at the time, there was a lot of excitement around uh, ESG reporting and rating agencies. So my next bright idea was, OK, let's look at all of these ESG rating services um, and let's try to get into how they come up with their ratings. And so, um, again, students together with me looked through all or a number of these different ratings agencies 
getting into their data. Um, and we got to the point where we thought we could understand, but then we hit this black box, this wall that basically um, it's a proprietary wall that we couldn't get through that we wanted to know, like if a company reduced its plastic emissions by uh, plastic waste by 50%, what would that do to their ultimate score? And we could never get into the details of those proprietary scoring frameworks. So although these are excellent, uh, they're helping more and more companies to uh, actually disclose more and more. For our purposes, uh, they weren't um, very helpful. So that moved us into, though, this phase of research that I'll be explaining to you right now and where we've sort of netted out. So um, with the proprietary wall that we banged into, what we did find is all of these different frameworks for ESG reporting, sustainability reporting, come mostly with a complete and public list of all of the disclosure requirements that they're asking companies to make. So we've gone now through uh, three different wave, uh, waves of research. We've gone through more than 23 of the world's top ESG and sustainability reporting frameworks. And let me basically explain what we've done. So we started in 2020. Um, luckily, Doshishi University was very um, uh, generous with uh, research funding support during the COVID crisis. And so we were able to actually form a team of research assistants and collect um, 357 impact measurements from these different uh, models or frameworks. And so let me explain what we did. So here's GRI. So GRI is one of these 15, and here's their, their disclosure 202-1. And it says ratios of standard entry level wage by gender compared to local minimum wage. So that's the disclosure requirement. So the first step was just to test were these seven stakeholders that the Business Roundtable, World Economic Forum, um, and that even I in my book am talking about, are they supported in what these ESG and uh, sustainability reporting frameworks are asking for. So this one went into employees and then we did it 356 more times for the other impact measurements. And basically we started with an Excel spreadsheet and it looked like this, but our results from step one showed yes, actually, um, these frameworks are talking about these seven stakeholders. Actually, it was six. Um, shareholders weren't talked about, and that at first got me a little nervous until I realized that we've been um, talking about and understanding how to measure shareholder value for a very long time. So basically, that one was covered, and all the other six were included in these ESG and sustainable reporting frameworks. So then the next step was we had now categorized those 357 into those seven stakeholder groups. We followed very standard uh, qualitative data analysis and we started to group or code the different impact measurements by theme. So we tried to narrow these down within here, the employee category you can see on the left, we narrowed these down into groups of themes. So to create employee value, what these frameworks are saying is you need to focus on diversity and equity, fair wages, health, welfare, and safety, development and training, engagement and satisfaction, and human rights. If you're thinking about creating value for nature, you need to be focused on waste and pollution, water, energy, products and services, biodiversity, and buildings and land. So we did that again for customers, for partners, uh, for society and firms. And again, I said uh, shareholders wasn't covered. So we used economic value added as our proxy for shareholder value. And the details of all of these are in white papers that uh, you can download for free from our website. But basically this step two finished with 27 clear themes across these seven stakeholder groups. And then Milton Friedman came back um, and his argument was, well, there's no rigor behind anything that we're talking about. So then we looked at all of these different impact measurements individually that we'd separated into themes to see just how good, how rigorous were they? And specifically related to value washing, how good at they were, were they at removing value washing? Were there clear goals uh, that they were driving at? Could they be objectively measured? Were there independent feedback loops that were actually in place and being done? And did they have a scale variable? Was it not just yes, no, are there women on your board of directors, yes or no, but the percentage of women on your board or the number of women on your board would be a scale variable. So um, the top scoring impact measurement could get five points if it scored uh, well across all of these. 
and obviously the lowest scoring impact measurement would get zero points. So again, the Excel spreadsheet started to get really busy and really small, so it looked like this, but we were able to go through one by one and score each of the 357 impact measurements, and then start to look at each of these themes that we had created and say, how rigorous, how grounded are they in the data that we have? So you can see here, it's kind of hard to read, but um, on the left-hand side, we've got the stakeholder and then the themes that uh, were derived from them. And then micro indicator or the number of impact measurements that aligned on that theme. And then frameworks means how many of those are original 15 frameworks that were actually covered. And then you see those scores from zero to five. So, and we went through each and every theme to see how good they were at actually not only measuring value, but also reducing or eliminating value washing in the process. And unfortunately, in our first round at this, 100% um, of the impact measurements, none of the impact measurements um, scored five points, 100% were uh, four or below. And actually most were three or below, only 5% of impact measurements across these first uh, frameworks that we looked at uh, had four points. So again, um, a lot of talk about um, value and measurement and sustainability, but this is why I said it earlier that I think stakeholder capitalism has given value washing superpowers because we talk about these things. But the actual rigor that Milton Friedman put out there as a challenge to us to actually um, measure and deal with social responsibilities that businesses have are still not being met. Even this was in 2020, uh, but even today in 2022. So then we looked um, just to prove that each of these themes was supported across these different frameworks. And then also we looked at the frameworks to see how well they actually covered uh, each of these themes. And then finally, what we did is go from the individual themes, now that we had proof that they were okay, uh, we went deeper to actually look at goals. So again, the details of this are in our white papers. They're all available for free for download from uh, our website. But you can see um, maybe here in uh, the nature category. So we have in waste and pollution, um, the goals would be carbon neutral, zero non-greenhouse gas emissions, zero plastic pollution, 100% uh, waste reclamation and recycling, and zero sound and light disturbances. And these each are goal-based, so there's a clear end goal. So then we can rate how a company is doing across not only this theme, but all 27, because we've got clear end goals in these. Um, and so basically I'll show you, now we've transitioned over to a relational database, we've gotten rid of uh, Excel, and now here, this is in the theme of health, welfare, and safety for employees. And you can see there are six goals here, physical health, retirement provision, family medical leave, employee health care, occupational safety and health coverage, and employee mental health and well-being. Each of them has a goal. And then you can see down here, for example, physical health, there are clear KPIs, the key performance indicators that we've gotten from these actual frameworks. And then we have links back to the actual sources. So you can check exactly how GRI 403-4 talks about employee physical health. And if you're actually disclosing based on this framework, uh, you've got the, the link right there to help you understand how to do that. So in total, then we can create this forward looking dashboard across each of these 27 goals and actually uh, 27 themes and 81 goals, we can get a clear score. And we're not looking to score companies to embarrass or, or show how bad they are, but to start off with taking a temperature check and then building strategy going forward to make positive ongoing change. So this idea of choosing a goal and then aligning everyone along that same path to achieve those goals. So whether it's a huge multinational company or a solo entrepreneur, if everybody is marching to achieve the same goal, then we most likely are going to get there. So again, we've gone through two additional waves of research in wave two. We added the Stockholm Resilience Center's planetary boundaries, which were our first five point goals, excellent impact measurements together with SBTI, science-based targets, plus these others as well. Um, we basically doubled the number of uh, impact measurements in our model, but the model itself stayed solid. 
uh, and we've most recently done FRAG, uh, which is out of the European Union, uh, with 114 more proposed impact measurements. Again, the model is solid, and we've actually given feedback back to FRAG as to things that they could consider to change and, and adjust. Right. So basically, we're now applying this to actual companies. We're looking to build both qualitative and quantitative measurement results of these value impacts. Um, and we've got the Value Research Center focused on further developing this model, quantitatively and qualitatively proving it, distributed data, uh, distributed ledger technology and AI to actually make it all work, uh, and education, collaboration, and training. So wow. these three white papers are available for free download uh, through our website. You can download them now. And we are looking for joint research partners. So um, looking to partner with companies, with research organizations, um, with universities, with individual researchers around the world to partner with us to actually help us improve and expand this research. We also have a Global Innovation and Value Summit coming on November 18th, where we'll be launching a membership organization and our JUKU for membership and training uh, and certification. So we hope you'll join us there as well. So I'd like to thank Doshishi University for the funding, all of my great research assistants, and all of the speakers who are following me now to sort of talk about value in more detail. And uh, again, Heather and Minaisan from OIST, our great translators, and for all of you for joining us for the continuation of these discussions. So thank you all for listening to me for so long, and I'll turn it back over to you, Haruko. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, so so uh, anyway, so now we have to, uh, we'll, um, I'd like to turn uh, to, uh, to invite um, Professor uh, Hoshino uh, to to the audience, we will do this fireside chat uh, with Philip and Professor Hoshino. Um, who, and this is actually, um, I'm very, very uh, honored and proud to introduce Professor Hoshino, who's also been the ambassador uh, to the, the, the permanent mission of Japan to the United Nations uh, between 2017 and, tw and 2020. And uh, he was actually for for time uh, in charge of SDG issues, and as I said previously, he also founded um, last year uh, the ESG uh, IREC, uh, the Center at the Osaka School of International Public Policy. And so the purpose of this fireside chat really is to to take full advantage of the two very different perspectives. Uh, both, uh, both of them, of course, are academics, but uh, Hoshino Sensei has experience from public policy as our school actually does international public policy. And Philip comes from the business school uh, experience with a very passionate uh, pursuit for this value model. So um, I've prepared um, two questions, but I will just start. Um, for this fireside chat so that we can hear from sort of the two perspectives, one from perhaps the public policy side, the other side from the more sort of the business economic activity side. So um, my first question is uh, is this really, um, so since the uh, Millennium Development Goals and uh, the rounds of uh, climate change talks that uh, the world has been having since the 1990s, I think uh, the contribution of non-state actors, uh, particularly of uh, say NGOs, as well as uh, multinational corporations in, in the private sector um, have become uh, indispensable. That, that, there's, that we can't really achieve anything without their help. Uh, and in many cases, I think they're very, it's critical because um, since the Cold War, one thing has dramatically changed, which is the global spread of capitalism so that you have everybody getting wealthier everybody <laughs> engaged in pretty much the same economic system that is driven by what uh, um this western liberal capitalist capitalism but it and um but this because it's important because it all drives growth um and um <clears throat> But since then, uh, we've had the, the SDGs who came out to 2015 and the ESGs, which is a reflection of including this private sector, really seeks to hold now the private sector uh, and their economic activities more accountable to this realm of what is becoming a global public concern as well as a public policy 
uh, issue of international coordination. So um, I would like to ask uh, both of you, uh, in your views, what are the current challenges and how could they be overcome? And I know it's very general, but um, I thought we should start from here to move on. <laughs> so um, perhaps I could ask uh, Professor Hoshino first. Uh, thank you, Haruko, for your warm introduction. And I, I, I enjoy actually this uh, fireside chat format without necessarily a, a fire a place uh, behind <laughs> us, but uh, uh, this, I was already fascinated by the uh, opening presentation uh, by um, Philip on that value model. He rigorously put together <laughs> and, uh, uh, talking about the relationship between public policy and the private company or the role, uh, what kind of uh, uh, challenges we have. I think that the one of the challenges I think I'm thinking is to combine how we effectively combine, you know, public sector uh, efforts and the private sector effort. You know, uh, both uh, efforts are necessary uh, and uh, complementary, uh, supposed to be complementary, but uh, in often cases they collide to each other. Um, for instance, the, you are, we are trying to move the world towards the sustainable future, but you know there is a public sector, uh, for instance, uh, if I can name the one country, for instance, Russia, started war, you know, this is not the time to, you know, engage in war. We ha all have to work together to create a sustainable future where we can, uh, you know, um, graduate from the um, carbon-oriented, you know, society towards the net zero goal society. But, you know, the politics, uh, when it was the politics and security involved, you know, this kind of direction was totally, you know, um, get stuck or even go backward. Uh, at the same time, of course, um, the businesses need to be changed. That is uh, what exactly what uh, uh, Philip talked about, I think, you know, from the uh, one, a sort of capitalism uh, and towards the more, you know, um, uh, more uh, inclusive and the multi-stakeholder oriented capitalism. Yes, that kind of, yes. So uh, what we need now is a transformation um, towards the better future where the, the public sector and the business uh, sector all work together. Um, uh, this is uh, actually um, amazing for me to say this because I started my career as an academic, as a state-centric person, <laughs> talking about international politics, working on you know uh, international security, which is uh, more about the conflicts among the nations, which is actually actually is a reality in our world. But after experiencing three years as an ambassador of Japan to the United Nations, uh, particularly working on socioeconomic issues, one thing I amazed was the involvement and also the contribution of the non-state actors. That exactly what uh, Haruko talked about, the civil society on one side and also the private business uh, organizations, they are the sources of innovation. And uh, now we are uh, in the middle of this science summit, you know, this uh, science um, uh, comes from those, uh, you know, private uh, ingenuities. And I was uh, one time uh, um, very honored to play a role of uh, the co-chair of the, what we call STI Forum, Science, Technology and Innovation Forum for Sustainable Development where the member states of the United Nations all get together, uh, together with the uh, representatives from the private sector and science community, all talked about uh, how we best use uh, the uh, new you know, uh, knowledge and in innovation to accelerate the, the SDGs. So uh, I, this was a very uh, eye-opening experience for me that, uh, well, the SDG is set by the, uh, uh, at the United Nations General Assembly Summit, 
by the you know, representative of the all 193 uh, countries, member states. Um, and this is the, the role that the United Nations, only the United Nations can do is to make a consensus goal. Um, but uh, how, who, who will implement this? Well, the state, of course, has a responsibility to do that, but the, everybody has to participate in it. And then that the private sector has a, a very significant role. Um, so I, I, I'm uh, now excited to um, work on this project. That is a part of the reason why I established this ESG Integration Research and Education Center, um, which is uh, uh, for me to work closely with the business uh, uh, sector or the private companies and how, they, how, how best we in integrate environmental factor and the society factor and the governance factors to move the world towards the better uh, uh, direction. So, and I'm very honored to be one of the uh, partners to uh, Value Research Center of, uh, that uh, Philip organized. So in that, so my challenge but also that the expectation is how we can combine, you know, the effort from the private sector and also the public sector towards the same goal, which is the sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hoshino Sensei. So, Philip, um, yeah, what is what what are, what's from your perspective? What would be the, well, the first? I, first, I just want to say um, thank you to Hoshino Sensei um, for um, being here and participating, uh, as well as um, enabling me to actually be working with uh, the SG IREC Center and all the all the work that you and uh, Haruko are both doing. Um, so, and, and I couldn't agree with you more actually. So the, this idea of, um, I had shown one slide in my presentation about this net force calculation, right? And so it's a, it's a calculation from physics, but basically um, it says that if you've got, if you wanna have the greatest impact um, mm. If you have one vector, one, one force uh, going in a slightly different direction, you minimize the overall result. So if you can align all of the energy along the similar line, you get the highest end result. And so I think what we've got right now is um, still, again, in looking at all of these different frameworks, all of these different models, there's such a complexity. And there's um, there there seems to be um, sort of each one of these organizations has its own view on what may be correct or what is right. Maybe one's more focused on the policy side, one's more focused on an environmental side. And it, instead of taking a step back and looking at the big picture, how can we collaborate amongst all of ourselves? Um, in these best possible ways, we yeah. sort of get caught up in sort of the, this very small um, uh, sort of micro view of the situation. And I think mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. the United Nations and Hoshino Sensei with that view from 193 different countries and sort of seeing things at a global scale, I mean, this really is, it, it, the issues that are facing us are facing humanity at this point. And it's not something that we can do just um, some actors or some players. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, again, one of the themes, um, maybe it's because I'm teaching younger students uh, so much now, but this idea of um, a game versus disclosure, a challenge versus disclosure. Mm -hmm. And disclosure is something, right, when when we were growing up or when folks younger than, than us were growing up or are growing up, um, disclosing stuff, right? Like having to report on stuff is is always a negative, right? And yeah, yeah. you you build that relationship of I have to do this. And then, instead of that, how can we switch this around so we're collaborating together, right? And we're forward looking together. And once we've got those goals set, I think we can align 
uh, public policy. I think we can align business. I think we can al align everyday people like, like all of us here to really just do the things that are necessary to get us out of the mess that maybe people a generation or a couple of generations before us uh, or more started. So I, I think, again, this collaborative view, not mm -hmm. focusing on complexity, but simplicity, and trying to figure out that future path forward that we can all go together, that, that's the key challenge for us. Uh, in that regard, I uh, wanted to go up, uh, one step further. Yes, I think we are thinking about the same thing. We want to make change, but the people are not so much, uh, you know, excited about, or sometimes they are reluctant about, or even negative about the change. Right. While we see that the world is definitely needs a change. And um, um, you look, look at this, I, 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 honestly speaking, and many of you may also feel that uh, the same kind of sentiment uh, that uh, well, global warming, is that real or is that scientific or something? And that kind of skepticism on one side. And also there's always a discussion on we are at the crossroads and we are in the water uh, shed the moment. And um, every time we hear that kind of thing, you know, oh, once like, uh, an another watershed moment, no watershed moment or another crossroads. No, this is really the <laughs> watershed moment. And uh, we have to, be very serious about, but the many people who are too much accustomed to this kind of, uh, you know, uh, discussion. Or, uh, so um, even the talk of sustainability uh, becomes so common that uh, makes us uh, uh, feel nothing serious. That, that is a kind of uh, the challenge we have to go over it. Uh, so that uh, I do not want to alarm the world too much. So I sometimes feel, feel that the healthy sense of urgency or healthy sense of uh, crisis is something we need to generate. Otherwise, and at the same time, when we need to make a, a significant change, uh, we need to go past the critical mass, right? Uh, if we are successfully go over that critical mass, a uh, mass, uh, not the mathematics, but critical mass, <laughs> uh, we can, you know, um, change the world like a cascade or to the, you know, snowball roaring. Um, but uh, we, if we are uh, making minor changes, um, that doesn't happen. So the role all of us here uh, listening to this discussion uh, should combine our consciousness and the uh, energy to move things forward to achieve you know the critical mass um, or before the the world go across the so-called tipping points <laughs> which is to move towards the un unsustainable you know disastrous future uh, so this uh, discussion of anthropocene uh, kind of uh, idea is so important from uh, my perspective, and I think many of uh, us uh, here uh, share the sa same kind of sentiment. Thank you. Thank you, Hoshino Sensei. Um, I think this this is probably a discussion in itself, but um, I'd like to move to the second question. Okay, okay. Uh, which actually moves all, also. I think it will act as a segue to the the presentations that will follow. Um, which it, it is um, actually something that takes on from what Hoshino um, Sensei mentioned about Russia and the consensus building that only the United Nations can do. But at the same time, yes, this is a tip. We are, we are in a tipping point also where the international system might not be sustainable. I think this is, you know, China and the United States agreed to cooperate on climate issues and yet because of Russia, now that sort of uh, pragmatic cooperation is also seen to be sort of sidelined for the moment. Mm -hmm. So we are really in a in a serious situation. I very much agree. But so um, but I think this China and you know if we talk about sort of Russia too, um, I think we also need to look at the other sort of phenomenon that is happening: the bifurcation of international politics. But if we look at from this capitalist points of view so we have this neoliberal capitalism 
which I think is has been under sort of a critical gaze uh, for for some time, particularly with the rise of SDGs um, and um, with this excessive focus on growth at all costs. Um, but um, here I would like to bring to the to the main thrust of this uh, session, which is that. Um, the capitalism is not really all the same everywhere. And um, I think even amongst the major powers, the G7 or the G20, um, different social, cultural, and historical values um, do mark very important differences in how companies behave, they make strategies, or economic policies are generated. Uh, and um, for here, I would like to bring, I think, Japan, is is now a sort of sometimes overlooked but a very good example of this slightly different type of capitalism slightly different type of economic sort of philosophy mm -hmm. uh, because from the 70s to the 80s japan was studied by the still the cold war sort of western world as a sui generis or exceptional mm -hmm. or not western even though it was very mm -hmm. successful but I do think that Japan's economic success and it's still sort of durability um, surely has some enduring value and perhaps a universal relevance, which, you know, it's universal values are not just a liberal Western thing. So I would like to think that Japan also has some universal sort of uh relevance as well as some maybe that deserves uh, some reappraisal in today's mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. So I would like Hoshino Seisei and um, mm -hmm. uh, Philip to sort of remark about what that might be, what mm -hmm. might what sort of relevance Japan might be, and what can Japan's experience, 150 years of modern capitalism, um, bring to the current international effort to achieve sustainable growth or ethical capitalism, because this, I think, is an important segue to uh, the presentations that will follow. So, mm -hmm. so Hoshino Sensei, would you like oh, to go first? <laughs> I don't know if I'm a right person to answer the question uh, as a political scientist by training. <laughs> But the capitalism is a, a very interesting idea based on uh, ideology on one side and the human nature on the other side. And, uh, and uh, neoliberal um, capitalism is so dominant in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in one uh, originated maybe from the United States and some, some, but has some universal uh, uh, impact. But uh, yes, I agree with you that uh, uh, there are many. Uh, there should be many application or the implementation of capitalism, and um, and um, even in the ideological side, I tempted to promote the idea or notion of ESG capitalism instead of <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the neoliberal or anything. Uh, for instance, the, why I say this with the, the capitalism based on ESG naturally drive the, the, the uh, you know uh, our uh, economic activities towards E environment and society and also that the good governance. So that I think is a kind of uh, uh, hope. But even this ESG um, capitalism can take many forms. I think in many societies and many countries. And how how how. How then Japan can uh, implement it? Yes, as uh, Philip uh, kindly and already, you know, effectively introduced that we have a tradition. So uh, there should be some unique part of, uh, you know, ESG capitalism Japan version <laughs> in one way or the other. And uh, and one and I'm very impressed with uh, that the longer standing, uh, you know. Um, Japanese companies, which has been successful, but uh, uh, um, one one caution or one one um, uh, how should I say mm, uh, one thing I'm a bit concerned about is the the complacency, the fear, you know the problem of complacency. If the the company is so successful in the long run, uh, they consider there should be no 
need to change <laughs> because they have been su successful for the past 100 years. But as I told you, we are in a crossroads in a really a change to the, uh, the better. So the success, truly successful company must have changed in that, uh, you know, while maintaining certain continuity. Uh, so that balance of change on one side and the continuity on the other side, uh, I, I'm, I, I think the Japanese companies are now in the very critical moment to, to be tested, whether they can be successful toward the future. If they are complacent about the way we have, uh, they have been doing, uh, we, I, there's no, uh, you know, uh, proof that the same recipe can achieve this major problem of uh, sustainability goals that we are going to pursue. Um, that is my uh, immediate answer to your uh, question. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Hitchin. So, Philip, and now yeah, you know what I, to do. You have to just <laughs> the intro to the sessions that's going to I, th I think this is a perfect segue into the panel session, actually. So because um, uh, some of the people who are waiting to speak next are actually much, much deeper experts and can probably answer that question much better. So um, again, I, I think that Japan does have some very interesting things to teach the world and also obviously um, share, uh, as well as this entire Asia region. Uh, so maybe I can turn it back over to you, Haruko, and then um, I think the answers to my question are going to, the way that I would answer is probably going to come from our next speakers. Okay, all right. And thank if they you. miss anything, I'll, I'll wrap up at the end, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Philip and Oshin, as I say. So um, now I'd like to turn to the, the, the third session. Uh, which is uh, we'll have uh, some uh, expert speakers on on different topics that will be addressing both that sort of philosophical, economic, um, and also from a, a policy side of uh, what this value model uh, could uh, is basically supported. Um, sorry, is achieved. Sorry trying to achieve. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Masato Yamazaki, are you, uh, who is, he is also, he's uh, the, uh, the board member of the Value Research Center, as well as a Professor Emeritus of Economics at the Aquinas College, Michigan, USA. And so he would uh, speak about the, the the more of the philosophical approach to Japanese uh, ethical capitalism. So please, Yamasaki Sensei. Yep, thank you very much. I have uh, prepared um, uh, some of the philosophical and then uh, spiritual kind of uh, aspect of uh, Japanese capitalism, uh, which is called the moral, uh, moral values for the ethical capitalism that I like to present today. Um, uh, let me begin with um, my kind of a thought about this uh, ethical capitalism. Uh, without moral sentiments, i.e. the moral values by Adam Smith, market economy collapses. In fact, it has been collapsed. Uh, we learned that selfish individualism and exploitive liberalism bring chaos to our community. For survival of human civilization, it is extremely essential to reestablish a solid foundation of moral values. For that reason, it is worth paying attention to the well-established and long-lasting moral values in Japan. Um, now, we cannot uh, uh, talk about the moral values in Japan <clears throat> uh, without recognizing uh, Ninomiya Sontoku, uh, from 1787 to 1856, uh, <clears throat> who influenced so many brilliant business leaders in Japan, such as Shibusawa Eiji, Toyoda Sakichi, Mikimoto Kokichi, Doko Toshio, Matsushita Konosuke, Inamori Kazuo, etc. Um, <clears throat> Ninomiya Sontoku was an important uh, agrarian reformer an economic thinker of the late Edo period, which is 1603 to 1868. 
born to a peasant household, and he educated himself and overcame entrenched class divisions to become a distinguished agricultural administrator, financial innovator, and economic philosopher. Um, Ninomiya also developed his own system of economic ethics, Hotoku, which was to have a profound influence on later generations. The Hotoku philosophy stressed behavior consistent with a sense of gratitude toward one's family, one's ancestors, the larger community, and the earth. To this end, it set forth basic principles of conduct, um, she say, or honesty and sincerity, and then kindle or diligence, bundo or budgeting within one's means and and and, and suijo, what people nowadays might term uh, giving back. Ninomiya preaches the economic activities aimed at the accumulation of wealth could benefit society as a whole if anchored by such virtues as restraints and altruism. Such concept laid the ethical and the spiritual foundations for modern Japanese capitalism, performing much the same no role that the Max Weber of 1864 to 1920 attributed to the Protestant's ethic when tracing the development of Western capitalism. Ninomiya's philosophy of Hotoku inspired some of the most iconic and pivotal figures in the economic history of modern Japan. His spiritual heirs include industrialists Shibusawa Eiichi from 1840 to 1931, the father of the Japanese capitalism, the entrepreneur Yasuda Zenjiro from 1838 to 1921, who helped uh, Japan's modern banking system, and the inventor and industrialist Toyoda Sakichi from 1867 to 1930, who established Toyota. Legendary Matsushita Konosuke from 1894 to 1989, a founder of Panasonic. Inamori Kazuo from 1932 to 2022, the founder of Kyocera. Um, I now <clears throat> want to share a parables of the law of trough water by Ninomiya. All human beings are born in a state like an empty trough that is at first without property, ability, or anything else. Nature and many people fill the trough with water. Only people who realize the appreciation of the water want to give it to others. And they want someone to be happy. So they try to push the water toward the other person. And the happiness is something that will come back to you again, even if you give it to others that you no longer need it. And the water will never leave you. But if you think that water is your own, you take it for granted that you be filled with water, you feel you never have enough. And it try to rake in more and more and happiness will run away. In other words, if you try to be altruistic or lita, not only will the other person be half pleased, but the happiness will also come back to you with great results for yourself. Shibusawa Eiichi actually showed us by many excellent examples of this parable as a public interest priority company among 500 companies he established in his lifetime. 
Um, moral values refer to a set of principles that guide an individual on how to evaluate right versus wrong. People generally apply more va values to, to, to justify decisions, intentions, and actions, and also define the personal character of a person. An individual with high moral values typically displays characteristics of integrity, courage, respect, fairness, honesty, and compassion. The basic foundation of the individual character is developed during the child's early years and then partly shaped by the virtue values and the beliefs of the parents. Educators and peer interactions also play an important role in moral value formation. We strongly emphasize the Value Research Center, particularly the Juku, as a very important mission to teach individual moral values to align businesses in the world with the principle of ethical capitalism as Shibusawa age taught us. Um, I think as I appreciate the opportunity that I can discuss about this particular moral values, but maybe later, if I have any questions, I happy to respond to the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yamazaki. Um, so now I'd like to turn to uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Yoshie Sugai, who she will be um, talking about uh, a slightly more particular uh, spirit of Japanese martial arts uh, as is one of the very important philosophical underpinnings of Japanese sort of business and corporate culture. So, Yoshie san, are you ready? え、日本には道徳、独特の文化があります。茶道、華道、書道、柔道などがあります。これらの道には誰もが歩める修行してある分野を収める道徳の3つの意味が入っています。その社会を繁栄させ平和に導くリーダーを育てるという人格形成です。その武道の教え徳から勢力全容自他共演について、お話いたします。私の合気道の恩師木根淵徹先生は望月実先生の地でした。その望月実先生は柔道の創始者の加納
文化や環境によっても異なるでしょう。自分にとって良いことであっても、他者にとって良いことではないかもしれません。良いことの判断基準の一つとしては、は法律がありますが、それも国々によって異なります。また、人は自分の考えや行動を正しいと思いたく、それは心理学的にも普通のことです。それでは、どのように良い、の判断をしたらよいのでしょうかそれは科学者の皆さんが一番よくご存知です。疑問を持つ。望月みのる先生は技は常に進歩しなければならない。そしてその進歩のためには常に疑問を持ちなさいと言われました。今ある事実に疑問を持ち、いろいろな人の話をよく聞き、新たな目と思考で何度も見直すことによって、より効果的な結果を得ることができます。良いことだと信じてきたものを、再度多角的な視野や思考から見直すことは、手間もかかりますし、プライドも傷つくので、容易ではありません。ですが、リーダーである人こそ、その勇気を持つことが必要です。そうでなければ、自他共演に導く,導くことはできませんそれでは今からの望月みのる先生の過去の戦争や紛争という厳しい状況の中にもかかわらずこの勢力全容自他共栄という理念を信じ実行された実例をお話しいたしますその当時望月みのる先生は武道を教えモンゴル人の文化を高め生活を向上させて、彼ら自身に自らの国家を建設させる意欲を喚起する一度になれば、そういう思いでモンゴルの中学校に柔道と剣道を教えに行かれました。さらに武道だけでなく、日本とモンゴルの友好を親善のためにあの尽力したいと、地元民のために黄河の支流に200メートルの橋を建設しました。また、その時の政府の官僚と意見が合わず、大抗論をしても、当時モンゴルにいた日本大使と交渉し、資金を集め、現地の農民も望んだ旧高賀歌唱の再開発をしました。後に、1987年に、望月みのる先生が視察に訪れた際には、土地は3倍に拡大され、かつて半砂漠の荒地が緑をなす高地に生まれ変わり、600万平方キロにわたる地域に水を供給できるようになっていたそうです。かつての農業に携わる人数と収穫高も大幅に増加していました。また、望月みのる先生は、権力者が他者を支援すべきだという自他共栄の考えと、そしてその他者も意欲を持ち、頑張る,頑張るべきだという、勢力全容の考えを述べていました。当時、たくさんの人が戦いにより、利益を得ようと必死になっている中、望月先生のように、国境や心情、人種を問わず、みんなが反映するようにと、一生懸命能力を良いことに活用していた人がいたという、そういう事実を皆さんに知っていただきたいのです。つい最近、アフリカでも自他共演に似たような言葉があると聞きました。またテレビで戦争の時であっても、ドイツ人の船長一人が900人の難民の命を救うために精一杯努力したというドキュメンタリーも見ました。世界中にそのような例があると思います。こういう勢力全容自他共演の考えをもっともっと、えー、みんなが持ったなら、私たちには武器などいらず、世界に本当の平和が持たされるでしょう。残念ながら、現在も世界のあらゆる場所で戦争や企業同士、または個人同士の争いが起こっているのが現実です。そのことにより、私たちの未来と地球に多くのダメージを与えています。自分の、自社の、または自国の利益だけに目を向けていてはいけません。自分だけが勝つための競争ではいけません。みんなで優れた科学で科学や技術を活用し、すべての自然環境や
純人類が良くなるための競争をするべきです。これは理想かもしれません。ですが、理想を現実にするのは私たちがやるかやらないかにかかっています。世界中にある道が繁栄と平和,平和に続く道になるために、あなた方の信じる良いや良い競争とは何なのかを再度見直していただき、そしてみんなで一緒に勢力全容、自他共栄をやりましょう。終わります。はい、ありがとうございました。Thank you. Thank you,、uh, Yoshida さん。Very、um, powerful message.、Uh, so、um, now I'd like to turn to、uh, Jin Montesano, who will be actually talking about、uh, Lixel.、Um, and this will be、uh, one case where it's okay. Sorry, I'm just seeing some hands. Oh, okay. Sorry.、Um, <laughs> yeah. Hi, Thank you. If you're ready, please, please go, go ahead. Sure. I'm going to、uh, share the screen from my side. So,、yeah. thank you very much、um, for the opportunity to present. My name is Jin Montesano, and I work for a company called Lixel. And it's a very interesting and unique company. But,、uh, well, to me, perhaps I'm biased. But the most important thing I want to say is that Lixel has been transforming from being a very domestic,、uh, low growth Japanese company to a very proud and purpose driven global company. We are today listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and our story is quite unique in the sense that I like to say that we're. A 100 year old startup, and I'll talk a little bit about why. So, the title of my topic is Transforming with Purpose. Lixel's purpose is actually very clear 65,000 employees across 150 countries. We operate under one key idea, and that is that at Lixel, our purpose is to make better homes a reality for everyone, everywhere. As you can see here, Lixel has a very unique history. We are a company that's built on a very long history of excellence. We were created in 2011 when five long standing Japanese companies, Inax, Tostem, Shineke, Toex, and Sunwave, decided to unite their futures as they could see the low growth and declining population and aging population of Japan and said, we must build a company together using. Our vast resources and our know how, and create a future for the next generation. Together, this these five companies created Lixel, and they decided not to use one of their own names for the new company and chose a new name. And Lixel actually、uh, is an invented word, and the L I and the I L is basically the meaning is the intersection between life and living. And that is how Lixel was born. Then Lixel went on to acquire additional global entities like American Standard, Toastem, and Inex. In short, Lixel is actually a global pioneer and leader in what we call water and housing technology. And our innovation dates back to the 19th century, as some of you might have heard of some of these very famous brands. A billion people, just to show you the scale of our company and our reach, a billion people get up every morning and use our products every day to get their children to school, get themselves to work. We are in a vast number of categories, from construction methods to tile to solar systems, and of course, in a x bathrooms, toilets, bath systems, kitchen systems, gardens, doors, floors, interiors, sunroofs, carports. We basically can build an entire home with Lixel products. We're not necessarily in construction, but we actually work in adjacency with construction, and we like to call ourselves a slow moving consumer goods company. One of the really cool things about Lixel、um, is that because we had come together in a relatively、um, recent time, 10 years ago, when I first joined the company, we seemed to be lost as to what was. Our reason for existing. And I really was very lucky to arrive at a time when we were going to ask this very important question of ourselves. Having merged five Japanese leading companies and then acquired a few more globally, the German Groa and the American Standard in the US, we really needed to take a step back and ask this question. And at the end of the day, we decided that Lixel must create value 
by finding a path that allows us to serve our stakeholders and societies in a meaningful way. Many Japanese companies or even global companies don't have that luxury. They might have come successfully along the way and perhaps today they're wondering how to pivot or how to actually respond um, to the to the challenges of sustainability and how to change their organization we had the imperative it was an existential imperative to really step back and reflect on that and this value creation model that i show you here today really shows you that uh, and this is actually extracted from our integrated report, which is the annual report we make to investors and stakeholders every year. And we very clearly say that how we create value starts, number one, with our purpose. That drives us to determine and define the resources that we rely on. And as you can see here, and I won't go into great depths because I don't have that much time, but you can see here that we outline the seven critical resources that Lixo relies on. And then those resources are used in such a way that allows us to create value. And we describe that at the center of the way that we create value is our people. So we very much believe that our people are our most important value activation centers. How we leverage our people is through these key points that I've raised here, strong governance, clear strategic goals, a modern work environment that's flexible and so forth. When we create value leveraging Lixil's people, we know we have achieved a sustainable path for long-term growth and performance when we have actually achieved the outcomes we've set for these critical stakeholders. And here you can see that our stakeholders really start with employees and then our consumers and customers, business partners, societies, and shareholders. Only then do we believe we've actually achieved the right path for sustainable growth. And then we reiterate that by going back to thinking about our purpose. Um, under each of these tiles, there's much more data and much more um, information. But today I've just simply showed you uh, on a page and we can go into more detail if you like, because it's all in our integrated report. One of the most critical pillars of how we activate our purpose is really to think about our key strategies. As, as one company, we can't do everything. So we looked at our know-how and our expertise and said, what are we really good at as a company? Because if a company is very good at something, it's making profit doing that thing. And we decided to take what we thought were our strengths and then overlap that with what we thought were society's needs. Because we did not believe that the best way to build a strong and integrated purpose that is activated in society and in our company and supporting the company to do well was something that we created on the side. You know, some kind of CSR activity or some philanthropy thing that we just kind of did on the side because we wanted to be a good company. We didn't want to do that. So we decided to really explore and understand what are we actually really good at? And we found, for example, that we're very serious otaku when it comes to moving water in and out of homes, whether it's through your toilet or your bath system or your shower set or your faucet taps. So sanitation and hygiene became a really powerful calling card for our purpose. Employees were very moved and activated. When I began this journey, I found so many people within the um, organizations globally in Japan and in different parts of the world that were working on unique innovations for sanitation and hygiene challenges in the world. So as you can see here, we have three critical pillars. Again, I won't go into all of them, but I will touch a little bit more on sanitation and hygiene. As all of you know, this is a critical global challenge. We're sending now people to Mars, but the fact of the matter is one in five people on this planet live without a basic toilet. That's 1.7 billion people. 2.3 billion people have no hand washing facilities at home. And actually, hand hygiene is the first line of defense against COVID. 494 million people today still practice open defecation. And while you think about the inconvenience of that, you're, you also have to extend yourself to how that can actually pollute rivers and fields and communities, which actually hurt the ability for children to have healthy lives and to be even, even able to reach the age of one or age of five. As we know, the diarrheal uh, death due to diarrheal diseases on a daily basis, that number is very high. So Lixel decided that it would take its know-how and its passion around sanitation and hygiene innovations and issues 
and put a target out there. And we decided that through our own innovations and our own investments and efforts, we will aim to improve the livelihood of 100 million people through safe sanitation and hygiene solutions by 2025. We set out this ambitious tar target and commitment and we explained it to the world. Now, just, just to pause there for a second, even though we're focused on SDG 6, you can see that when you impact global sanitation and hygiene, you actually have many interdependencies with the other UN SDGs. For example, you know, girls become smarter when there is a toilet at school. We're finding that under UNICEF data, girls drop out of school when they enter menstruation period. Because there's no toilet in their rural schools, they don't go to school for that week and they continue to fall behind, eventually dropping out of school. So education can be improved. That goes to gender equality. We know for a fact that it helps to improve the situation of some hundred children under the age of five dying on a daily basis due to diarrheal diseases, for example. So I just wanted to explain here very briefly how global sanitation and hygiene focus actually supports other SDG targets that we are trying to support. Oops. Um, how are we doing that? Well, I want to introduce you to a social business we created called SATO. SATO stands for safe toilet. And the reason why we use the term safe toilet is because the UN's definition of a safe toilet is when the human's contact with waste or fecal matter is separated firmly. So if there's a hole in the ground, that is not considered a safe toilet. We invented something called the SATO toilet. And, uh, you know, my CEO, Kinyo Seto, likes to say that, you know, we make the $5,000 kind of toilet, but the $5 toilet is actually the one he's more proud of. And this toilet is actually very easy to install, saves up to 80% water compared to flush toilets, because you basically use a little bit of water, a cupful to flush. And there's a very um, unique low flow engineering um, weight counterweight that allows the water to flush down into a septic tank or a cesspit, depending on where, where we're um, putting the Sato toilet. We also, during COVID, invented something called the Sato tap, which is an affordable hand washing solution off grid as well, just like the Sato pan, which can be used in the home or in shared use in communities. And this actually won Time's Best Inventions of 2020 because we were able to launch that and with our partner UNICEF, get it out to the markets, knowing that hand hygiene was the first line of defense against COVID. And many people did not have access to good, safe uh, hand hygiene. Now, how does the Sato social business work? We actually leverage local and global partnerships to bring the most value to community. We make, sell, and use locally. We work with local manufacturing partners. We manage the product distribution in the market in which we want to distribute and sell, and we also maintain it locally. But if you think about it, because there was no such supply of a safe toilet at the base of the pyramid, we had to also create that ecosystem, we had to create the sustainable market, which meant we had to work with NGOs and different inter, um, international organizations to build skills training and outreach. To, we actually created um, entrepreneurs who would then be taught how to create the toilet itself and so that they could become installers at the base of the pyramid. And so not only did we have to do the skills training and outreach and go village by village to gain understanding about how the toilet would work and create the value, we also did a lot of promotion and awareness building of why it's valuable for you to own a toilet in your home. UNICEF uh, became a very important partner to us and really ended up helping us to accelerate uh, the entry of our products into market. Today, improving access to sanitation around the world is a reality. As of today, we've already shipped over 6.5 million units to 45 countries. And that under the UN calculation of five people per unit household, 35 million people have received improved access to basic sanitation and hygiene. But we haven't stopped there because that's really short of 100 million. So as you can see, um, Oh, this is all about the Sato tap. And here's our inventor. Actually, Daigo Ishiyama is our inventor. He lives in New Jersey and he used to work. For, he was part of American Standard, not Lixel. And when we acquired American Standard, 
um, he's Japanese, we found him working on these products, these ingenious, what we call low tech products that can really serve the base of the pyramid. And he, we actually built a business around the Sato because we did not want to treat it like philanthropy. You know, in, in the private sector, I guess I'm the only private sector sp speaker, so I can say that it's really important for us to feel that a business model can be built so that any profits can be reinvested in the model. If it's philanthropy or if it's donation, at some point, people are going to take a decision that we don't have the money this year, so that program has to be cut. So we felt very firmly that if we believe that there's value in this product, that there is innovation and there's a consumer base, because whether you live on a dollar a day or a hundred dollars a day, we need to respect the consumer because the consumer is making consumable decisions for her and her household and her family. And so we decided we have to make a product that has value to her. She understands why she wants it or needs it and is willing to pay for it. We, of course, have to make it affordable. So access is not a problem. But we believe very strongly in creating a PL and a business model behind it. So Sato is a social business which has two critical factors for success. Financial factor, which is the break even, and the um, impact factor, which is 100 million people by 2025. And as you can see here, um, we were actually the first company uh, for UNICEF to sign on to a global shared value partnership. And uh, actually, I'm very proud of the fact that the first company UNICEF ever signed on to their innovative new global shared value partnership agreements was a Japanese company. Because in fact, they told us they were in talks with many other famous Western American companies, but we were the first. And together, we are continuing to expand our partnership uh, into even deeper markets today. Um, and then last but not least, this is really how we bring it all back together. Uh, we actually then help the company itself to further raise funds for the activities of Sato and for UNICEF through cause-related marketing. Like for example, the Gora brand recently just, um, was contributed 1.2 million euros by raising that money through its Energy for Life campaign to support the partnership. That made our partners in Europe so excited, our employees so excited to be working on this and making an impact on the program. And we believe this is how we can further generate. When programs are connected back into the business and there's accountability for the program, not separate and run as if it's just some uh, CSR program, it can actually be much more sustainable and, and deliver the kind of impact that one is seeking. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. This is really exciting. Actually, I didn't <laughs> know about the Sato, Sato toilet. I have to. Uh, okay, so um, now I'd like to turn to uh, uh, Trista Bridges, who I think will also expand on this very happy sort of yes. situation, uh, yeah. the win-win business. Great. So thank you. Please go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think I'm going to share some slides now for a moment. And uh, it's very interesting hearing Jen's, Jen's um, perspective and some of the things she was saying, which I'm going to actually talk about a little bit in my presentation today, if I can figure out how to move my... Yes, we go. Okay. So my name is Trista Bridges. I am co-founder of a organization called Read the Air. Uh, we work with companies of all sizes to help them become more sustainable. Uh, and we talk quite a bit about this topic and in Japan, and we've been doing this for a few years now. And the thing that's very exciting is that in Japan, this topic has really moved up uh, to the agenda of many businesses. In, in quite a spectacular way. And so I'm very, very excited um, to talk about this topic and also very excited about a lot of the change and progress we're seeing in Japan around this. So what I wanted to start with is um, the SDGs as we see here. And I wanna talk first a little bit about why the SDGs were a game changer in many ways for the world um, and also for businesses. And so I think it's important to start with um, a reminder that the SDGs actually were not created for companies, they were created for countries. And what that means is many of the frameworks and tools that we use to, to assess progress are not actually translated to a business type model. Okay, there's been some work since to be able to do that. 
Um, but I think it's quite interesting about how companies became so interested in the SDGs as really a guide um, for them thinking about how to kind of expand um, beyond the traditional model of how we assess value for businesses, because that's what the SDGs are ultimately trying to help us do as well. So what are some of the advantages? Uh, first of all, they gave us a common framework for what sustainability is. I think this is a really important thing to underline um, because when people think about sustainability, they tend to focus on the E part of sustainability when they hear that word. And that means everything related to climate, which is obviously incredibly important. But when we look at the SDGs, we see these 17 things on this slide that are incredibly important for us to have a functioning world, really, if you think about it in that way, and a world that the that you know, has longevity and that is sustainable. The second thing is it really encouraged engagement from countries and stakeholders that were not otherwise engaged previously. So what we often see um, with these types of initiatives and these types of efforts are that certain countries really get behind them and support them, um, countries do so. But I think this time we saw that regardless of a country's size, that they really saw the value in this model and how it applies to them in some way, shape or form. Certainly there's certain countries that are much more engaged. Japan is a type of country that's extremely engaged in the SDGs and really, um, really uses them as a way to kind of think about these different topics. Um, but it's important to kind of note that many, um, previously many countries might have said, oh, well that's you know principally for the global South or for developing countries and not for me. I think when we look at the SDGs, I think most countries and people around the world can see how there's elements of this that really talk to what's going on in their own countries. And certainly other stakeholders beyond that, I would say the SDGs absolutely have made civil society uh, a much uh, more important and key stakeholder as they always should have been. But I think now they really have a seat at the table. And Jen talked a little bit about Lixel and some of the things that they're doing as well, um, working with civil society to kind of deploy their solutions um, in different parts of the world. And then the last topic, obviously, very business friendly, although again, structured for countries. I think most businesses look at these and say, oh, I see things that kind of connect with our business model in them. And I think that's a good thing. They don't always utilize them in the most effective manner, but I do think this really helped to kind of give business a framework for how they might think about these topics. But I should say we are definitely off track in terms of um, our progress, right? SDGs target 2030. We're definitely off track. And we're running out of time. And I think this cannot be underscored about how much we need, to, how much more we need to accelerate our progress on the SDGs. Um, a couple of uh, things I just want to mention. First of all, there was a widely reported research report, which some people might have seen that came out last year, that said the SDGs are not likely to be achieved at the current pace until 2092. This obviously would be a real tragedy for the world. Um, and obviously something that we absolutely need to accelerate. And why is this? Uh, what we're seeing are a couple things. First of all, the current trends in terms of our economic development, slow efforts um, from many of the countries, particularly those that are actually have the highest levels of impact, not moving quickly enough. And then certainly um, COVID has not been helpful at all. And particularly the global South has really affected economic progress um, and it's hampering progress in other areas. However, I do think that this is a pessimistic view. I'm hoping that we can do things in the coming years to accelerate on this. And we'll talk a little bit earlier about some of the things that we can do. I do wanna talk a little bit before we get to that about something that I actually like to talk about a lot, which is this idea of having a new model for business. And we've heard a lot today about new value models, but I have to say that the way our markets work, the way they function still very much is a profit first model. And this is something that we need to move away from. So what I wanted to talk about a little first is how we've kind of gotten to this realization that the business model we have doesn't really work and that many of the topics that I've mentioned earlier are really important and how we need to engage with them is in a way where they connect to what we do as an organization. So first we talk about philanthropy. If we look back at businesses in terms of how did they first engage with the world, right? Certainly we saw companies, if you look at a company like Johnson & Johnson, or Sanofi or Takeda in the pharmaceutical space, a lot of those companies started really as companies that wanted to solve a social problem. However, they evolved into being much bigger businesses. So what businesses often did was they, they came up with this idea of, well, you know, we really believe it's important to give back. Let's do that in a philanthropic way. So the kind of concept of corporate philanthropy evolved. 
Uh, but we often saw that these were very much auxiliary to business activities. And by that, I mean, they might decide, well, you know what, we want to really support orphanages. Not that supporting orphanages is a, is a bad thing, it's a great thing, but it didn't necessarily connect to what they wanted to do as an organization. And what ended up happening was we had um, foundations that were developed as kind of separate arms of businesses, but ultimately, and Jen mentioned this a bit earlier, if financial performance wasn't strong enough, those were the activities that often got cut first. And that's a real problem. Why? Because we really need that type of engagement from companies. We need that kind of support, but unfortunately it became conditional on um, the financial performance as the company. Next, we saw out of that, we saw corporate responsibility evolve. And, and certainly corporate responsibility um, is, you know, I'd say much more connected to the business a bit more, but we started to have some of the same issues. So first of all, what, did corporate, what does corporate responsibility mean and what does it look like? First of all, from our perspective, we see that as addressing the current state of the world, right? And maybe backwards looking. So by that, by, by that, I mean, we see that X is a problem. Let's do something as an organization to address X. Not necessarily, we believe that our business in the world is going to evolve in this way. And we need to kind of think about how do we kind of, how do we prepare for that? How do we maybe help the world address something that's going to happen, um, not only in the, in the current state situation, but also in the future. Next of all, um, it really focuses a lot on opinion formers and policy makers, governments and thought leaders and engagements on those. And that kind of often sh would shape um, things that companies would focus on. It was also focused on compliance. And this is something you know, that was certainly a motivator for, com for companies but you know, it was a key part of how they thought about corporate or social, social responsibility. So not just what I do philanthropically, but what I do to kind of respect the rules that have been put in place. And then also who was responsible for this? What we ended up seeing was that this fell to CSR departments, communication and government, government affairs teams, which are all have a lot of very smart and very talented people within them, but maybe aren't functions that are considered core business activities core strategic activities for the organization, such as finance or uh, procurement or um, strategy departments. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a model that's still a bit auxiliary, although it's getting closer to the company. And we like to think of this as business as usual, right? What do we think is what a company normally does is their business as usual. Business as usual really funds these activities, right? But what we want is we want a model where business of you, as usual is these activities. So when we look at sustainable business, certainly it needs to be sustainable. And that means in terms of its impact on the world and impact on um, its employees and all the many stakeholders that we've been talking through, talking about today, but also in, from a financial perspective, right? It needs to also deliver return so that you can kind of fund um, the normal activities of the business. It's also a model that really puts profit and planet and people on an equal plane and can really value um, the impacts of not actually thinking about the planet and people and its decisions. It aims to target the whole value chain. So it aims to say, okay, we're going to operate in a certain way in, in the right way, not just at the end of the value chain with our customers, but also upstream in terms of how we get, to, how, what do our raw materials look like? What are we getting them, getting them from? Are we working with our supply chain to make sure that they're respecting um, a lot of the rules uh, around um, around kind of human rights or other types of issues. Um, business strategy and operations is also a principal area of focus. This is also a big change as well. So many of the things, again, that Jen was talking about earlier, saying these are our business model. What are we good at? Let's focus on what we're good at. Let's deliver value for society and our customers and stakeholders, taking into account what our strategy is as an organization. It's viewed as a driver of growth, not as an impediment of growth. I think that's also important as well. You see many businesses saying, well, we can actually develop lots of great products and services around here this, that address the needs of our customers and also address the needs of society. And lastly, execution on responsibility really lies with management and operational roles. So they're actually on the hook, if you will. They're responsible for making sure that we actually go through with delivering this model. So when we're looking at acceleration, how do we get to that model? What do organizations need to do? And so I want to talk a little bit about some of these things um, before I close. The first thing is resourcing means commitment. 
There's a lot of companies that have said, yes, sustainability is on top of our agenda. It's very important. It's important that we move to becoming more of a sustainable organization, um, or we even move to a regenerative, regenerative capital type model, which means that we basically are creating even more value for society. Um, but they don't put the resources behind that. And by that, I mean the people, I mean the money. Um, you know, it is, it is not really a realistic proposition to expect that the CSR or sustainability department manage all of this on their own. Everybody needs to be managing this throughout the company. And you need to basically um, increase resources often, initially perhaps to be able to respond to this, to make sure that you can deliver on this strategy. There's something that's very important. Secondly, benchmarking is very important. Something that a lot of companies don't do around this area. They may benchmark, for example, their product services versus another um, competitor, but they don't think about what are our competitors doing on this? We wanna be better, we wanna be best in class on this. That means that they really need to benchmark how they're doing on this sustainability topic versus their competitors. The regulatory landscape is very important, making sure to stay current on that. Um, we're often getting questions from companies about, for example, the EU taxonomy or what is Japan doing? Japan is doing a lot to kind of roll out uh, legislation around this um, and there should be some more things coming in the coming years. It's important that organizations stay on top of this to understand this and how it's gonna affect their business. Make or buy, um, I stress this because in Japan, we often like to develop everything internally. Right? But unfortunately, this topic may be something that doesn't necessarily come from internal, um, in terms of capability, may not come internally. You may have to look externally for this. Um, and again, Lixila is a company that has done that, has come together from different types of businesses. Carefully assess whether you have the capabilities to develop more sustainable type businesses internally, or whether you need to partner um, or even acquire to do that. And then lastly, I'd say digital strategy, DX, as we say in Japan, is really important for two reasons. One, a measurement and also management. So certainly there's digital tools and solutions that can be developed, um, but we also need to be able to measure our progress. And technology, fortunately, helps us do that. And we have to make sure that we, can, we are prepared as an organization to be able to integrate technology in terms of how we manage this going forward. So thanks so much uh, for the time today. Um, I hope uh, that was a very helpful uh, overview for everyone. And I'm looking forward to the panel discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Um, OK, so uh, we have our final but not least, uh, last but not least, uh, presenter, uh, Kumar Ayer, who I believe will, are you, are you ready, Kumar? Yeah. OK. So. The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, great pleasure to be here at the tail end of this panel. And uh, we've heard some very interesting uh, talks here on principles, on purpose, on sustainable business models. On me falls the enviable task of telling you how the value model brings all this together. So one first thing that we need to realize is the importance of a threshold. Our principles act as a moral threshold for each one of us. There are certain do's and don'ts which we will not violate or we should not violate as a matter of principle. Unfortunately, this is seen more in letter than in spirit, but and more so in business where profits seem to exist without a threshold. So what the value model touches upon is having thresholds for every KPI that exists or that is measured in the value model, including profits. I know that this sounds like sacrilege for the corporate, in, the corporate sector. How do you cap? profits, but as was talked about both by Philip and by Masato, that we need to draw the line where profits go into greed. That's what this threshold is. The threshold actually marks the line between profit, good profit and greed. So the value model talks about these thresholds and 
We believe that these thresholds are very important in ensuring equality and justice. And equality and justice, not just within a society, but across society and bridging the gap, the huge chasm which exists between the global North and the global South. How do we do this? We believe that the value model has the spine to be the difference. The value model has a huge emphasis on localization. Localization in terms of manpower, localization in terms of resources, localization in terms of technology. Jean talked a little bit about their approach to using local technology, local manpower for their sato toilets. Fantastic. But we should do this not just to the Sato toilet, but across all sectors. And I don't mean to say, uh, I don't mean to point to Lixilk here, I'm saying corporates in general should work more and more towards the local population. Act global, but think local. That should be the motto. The value model also has a huge emphasis on diversity and inclusion. So we're talking about integration of different genders, different races, different economic strata of society, and trying to bridge the gaps that exist, the, in the inequalities that exist between these various sectors, various sections of society. And how are we going to create a society which is built on the principles of equality and justice. I would like to say something that comes to my mind from the novel Animal Farm. In that there is a line which says all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And that is what we see in society today, especially in the corporate sector. What the value model strives to do is eliminate this more equal feeling that exists in some of the animals. The other thing that the value model emphasizes on very strongly is local participation and local ownership. Businesses which have local roots tend to do better for the local communities. They are invested in the local communities and they bring about, they act as a glue which integrates the society and brings all sections together. Having a huge local presence will ensure that development comes to the local communities rather than the local communities having to go in search of development. This is what the, what the value model does. And by bringing all these various factors into a single ecosystem, we're able to create a society, a community in harmony with environment. All seven stakeholders that Philip talked about in the introduction, namely the customers, the employees, society, the, the shareholders, environment, partners, all of, all of them working single-mindedly towards the same goal. And this, we believe, will help drastically in reducing the inequalities and the inequities which exist, not only between countries, but within, a, within the same country. We see huge disparities in terms of income, in terms of living standards, in terms of access. By access, I mean access to technology, access to education, access to healthcare, access to resources within countries. I'm not talking between countries. Even within the same country, we see these huge disparities that exist. The COVID has only made things worse. Almost every single country has come out of COVID in a K-shaped recovery, which means the rich have had their riches 
multiplied many fold. And we have had huge swaths of population which have been pushed below the poverty line. These are the kind of disparities that the value model tries to eliminate. And how do we do this? We do this based on thresholds. We do this based on following the principles of equality and justice. We, fall, we, we achieve this by calling on everyone to follow their personal moral line. A personal moral line, a sense of ethics, which, each, which is ingrained in each one of us. As Masato mentioned in his talk, this comes from our childhood. This is what we are taught in our cradles. Unfortunately, capitalism has driven all these ethics out the window. We say, go back to your roots. Learn from your ancestors. Learn from your grandmothers and their mothers and how they would give you good thoughts and good ideas on how to behave with society, on how to be good global citizens. This is what the value model harks back on, bringing us back in touch with our roots, bringing us back on how to live happily within thresholds. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is that we may not be perfect, but we have made a start. And we believe that this is progress in the right direction. Growth is not the need of the hour. Inclusive development, we have grown enough. I mean, if anybody in, the, in his right conscience says that there is still room for growth, especially when our, we have consumed our resources for this year by the end of July. If anyone in his right conscience tells us that we have room for growth, then unfortunately, Krista mentioned about 2092 for achieving the SDGs. The earth may not be around in its present shape till 2092. So the need of the hour is not growth, but inclusive development. And we believe that the threshold-based value model, which is independently verifiable and which is not subject to interpretation like the other frameworks, would go a long way in mitigating the problems that exist in society today and would act as a bridge between the global North and global South so that these terms are consigned to history in posterity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kumar. Um, so uh, now we've been in intense uh, sort of uh, presentations and very stimulating for a couple of hours, but please bear with us for another half an hour as we uh, go into a panel discussion, which I'm sure we do not have enough time and uh, we can never do justice to all the points that were raised uh, in, in, in the presentations as well as uh, with the fireside chat. Um, and um, I am not even going to attempt to to summarize or try to synthesize anything, <laughs> except um, that uh, there are a few things that uh, came to my mind um, as uh, interesting. It's just two points. Um, one is um, that Hoshno Sensei and I pr come pretty much from a similar sort of background of uh, academic training. I also do international relations. I do sort of, uh, you know, the Westphalian system and um, the nation state and, and so on, and war and peace, those kind of uh, uh, things. Um, but I realized that in talking about these global issues, and there's a, there's a slight sort of lexicon difference. When we're actually referring to the same thing, we actually might be using different vocabularies. So I thought that something uh, in the future might be useful for those who are doing, uh, you know, sort of SDG issues or ESG uh, private sector issues and civil society issues 
and for uh, for for the likes of me who do more of uh, the uh, war and peace issues to actually perhaps um, share vocabs and terminologies because I think sometimes it's sort of lost in not in translation but at least um, in terms of meanings of words. Um, the other thing I thought that struck me was um, that there, there is something about um, the need to uh, redefine what is a public good. Um, it does seem to be that we're all looking for, because, you know, when we say public versus private, uh, one is sort of the governmental issues and public policy affairs, and the other side is the private. But as Kumar was also saying that, you know, this global south and global north needs to be relegated to the history books, um, I think we also seem to and you know capitalism has sort of thrown a lot of these sort of ethics or way of living uh into the sort of the gutter so to speak that how do we resurrect uh sort of the morals the ethics or something that really to me uh seemed like um the public uh, what is the public good uh, what is what what is the sort of the for example, the SDG goal of leave no one behind is that um, it seems that from all the talks, some, we're all sort of thinking about something that is in 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 the public sphere, and that, is, but that public sphere where everybody is supposed to be gaining or it's supposed to be in uh, for the benefit of all seems to be shrinking in some parts of the world and in some parts of the world it doesn't exist at all um so the, those are the two sort of but the first one is really um not that important but i thought that um perhaps we could sort of have a disc perhaps a sort of reactions about what we think about in our current system whether you call it the international system of states or whether we call it the sort of the global capitalist state or uh, or even we define what's growth um what are your views on the this sort of public good or the public what 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 it means to and how do we i mean kumar says go back to your roots go back to the local but this is something that I feel that um, needs some sort I, I don't know. I mean, this is something that it really struck me as going back to how do we define this sort of a, a space uh, where we think more, where the morals or ethics really do matter. I'm sorry, I was sort of totally um, <laughs> overwhelmed by everybody's <laughs> so can can I can I maybe um qualify that a little bit too Haruko because I mean I think um for for me uh, in looking at all of this and learning from everybody who um has spoken um today I mean I I have found that that key theme of value sort of everybody individually has that understanding of what value is and means to them and that seems to be a really um i've looked in a lot of places and for me it seems like a good place to like it, it's a it's a shared place that everybody can speak from and I, I don't know if that helps to sort of forward your question or not but it it seems to cut through all of the confusion and all because it's a very personal right value is a very um, individual thing, but when we all start talking about it, when companies start um, working with it, and when um, individuals start trying to help each other prosper together, and those when it all value seems to be a sort of a magic word, and I, I think that's sort of, um, I, I guess, maybe a potential way to focus that that different lexicon the different speaking is that so I'm not, am I, I just I, confusing I, I, I things? totally agree I didn't mean to sort of sort of sort of uh, stray from value but <laughs> to me it was it just seemed that um when we say public 
And, uh, you know, when we're talking about capitalism or neoliberal capitalism, and then we're talking about the sort of the East versus West, then there's one sort of what's defined as public in many sort of fit has, you know, different people have different understanding. Each society has a different sort of reaction to what is public as opposed to what is private. So I think perhaps yes, value is one key word that can bring, as 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 Kumar saying, the thing together. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to confuse everything, but um, so um, can I elicit some? Um, you can ignore my comments, but and uh, perhaps this is supposed to be a conversation. So um, please, anybody would like to to have? I have a, yeah, I have. If I, can, if I can just. Okay. Uh, jump in quickly here yeah uh, what is missing now is the innocence in the whole system and that's what i meant when i said go back to learn what you got from your grandparents and their parents when we are when we are children we have a certain innocence about us there's, there's no profit motive in what we do. There is no greed in what we do. There is no malice in what we do. We do it because we want to do it. We don't do it because we have to do it. These days, a lot of things happen because we have to do it. We have to be seen doing this. We have to be seen ticking this box. We have to be seen espousing this cause. It's not because we want to do it. We have to do it because we want to be in, we have to be good with society. And what we should look for is having to do things. That's what is, that is what is creating true value. You will be creating true value for yourself when you're doing the things that you want to do, not the things that you have to do. That, I mean, if I can loosely interpret the meaning of value, what will bring value to me is when I'm doing the things that I want to do rather than the things that I have to do. And more importantly, I would feel happy if someone did the same things to me that I am doing to others. Back to the question about public goods. I think one of the problems we have is a question of time and how long our time horizon is. So I'm not the kind of person who very much likes to, we often talk about, well, things were better before, things were, you know, we tend to look back a lot as society. I think we can learn a lot from the past, but I do think we forget that there's a lot of things in the past that were not good and that actually are a lot better today. And they just seem a lot worse because we are, we are, we have, we have information, right? We have much more available information. Um, but one of the things that I think that has actually probably gotten worse is time in our time horizon. So we, we, that's kind of like the heart of every problem because value you know, how do you assess value? If I assessed value of, you know, companies, for example, polluting 30 years ago, and I really had an extended period of time, then I would have properly priced that in. And I would have properly not valued those companies as much. And I, or I would have maybe penalized them, for example, from a, talking from a business perspective. But I think, you know, with public goods, I think the problem is to just this aspect of time and what's kind of happened to us over or especially in the last last several years, right? That we're not really taking into account long-term impact when we think about value. And then I would say just the second thing in terms of public goods is that, you know, that's really the heart of a lot of the debates today. What is public? What is private? Many of the problems we have kind of come back to that root. And we're just in a period, I think, of painful flux around that, just that problem. We need to get that problem answered. We need to get that question answered, I think, to move forward. And that's all I wanted to say. Could I have here from Hoshino Sensei or Jin? Um, I'll be happy to again. From me, uh, in, uh, the, someone with the political science background, it's funny to say this, but uh, there is a notion of uh, invisible hands, right? in the market and some there's a demand and the su supply, but somehow magically, you know, there is a balance that makes a certain 
um, you know, uh, uh, point in the market. Uh, uh, I'm very inspired that Trista said that SDG is a game changer. Uh, I think we are in the point uh, uh, where, or where or when we cannot totally rely on that kind of magical invisible hands <laughs> and, and a free flow of uh, you know uh, demands and supply. Some sort of guidance or some sort of engineering is needed to achieve the goals uh, which, uh, which we consider uh, uh, based on the consensus and the desirable uh, uh, things for the future. Uh, and the SDGs that, uh, uh, is something that represent that kind of consensus. There is one misconception about uh, uh, when I always uh, talk about SDGs with uh, kids or even for the business leaders, uh, they tend to uh, forecast the future and then um, what the kind of fu uh, future would be in 2030. And uh, in order to, uh, and uh, we like, and they envision something very, you know, uh, ideal. But the SDG is not. SDG is, has already set the goals, right? And the carbon neutral and uh, zero uh, poverty and the zero hunger and the clean toilet accessible to everyone leave no one behind. Of course, it's virtually impossible to achieve everything by 2030, but that is a kind of vision we all agreed, you know, in 2015 at the UN summit by the, uh, you know, head of states and others of 193. That makes that legitimate. Uh, th that is one thing. And another one is that since that the goals are set, so what we need to do is to backcast. So that is a, this, a discussion of backcasting is so important in this discussion of uh, um, MSDGs. So, but anyway, in order to uh, achieve that uh, uh, SDGs uh, by that time uh, horizon that the tourists talk about, we need extra effort, right? Uh, and um, uh, but in order to do that, probably, you know, in, we cannot rely on that invisible hands or anything, <laughs> some sort of guidance or uh, engineering should be uh, necessary. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> uh, uh, that came to my mind. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, if I might just add, we go back to this point about the public good. I think, you know, in, in Japanese, right, kaisha, the, the kanji for kaisha and shagai are reversed. And, you know, my CEO, Kenya Seto for Lixel always reminds me and reminds us in his speeches and so forth that we are actually part of society and we are a microcosm of society. And so it's almost like these big, powerful CEOs are are kind of running their own countries, if you think about it, or their own, you know. Um, and so those, we have to help corporations because you can't make them disappear. And frankly, I don't think we're gonna solve any of these public good issues without them. But we need to help corporations and their leaders understand that there is a very important symbiotic relationship here, that it's not about the PR, right in order for the next generation and the planet to survive we have to help them understand fundamentally what is it that makes you a good company as in profitable right how do you apply that to social needs environmental needs and how do you actually bring that sort of integrated approach to solving some of these problems and i think if people if companies understood that they're not firewalled they're not sort of discreet from the rest of the problems, but then in fact, they are not only contributing to the problems, they can also contribute to the solutions. And the more that we have these kinds of conversations, I think uh, the more uh, we need to recognize that we do need to work together. It's, it's, it's not um, going to help for us to say, you know, 
capitalism shouldn't exist. I think that's pra not practical and I'm a very practical person. I do think capitalism needs to act in the right way to, as we say, create positive impact. And every firm needs to figure out how to do that. And the way capitalism works is if the firm can figure that out, they're much more likely to be able to serve the next generation. And that is the fuel that allows the firm to incentivize themselves. And the firm that refuses to acknowledge that reality will become a dinosaur. And that is the fact in this VUCA cubed environment in which we live today, where every sector is being disturb disrupted, not only by their co own competitors in their peer set, but from other sectors. There is no such thing as a traditional competitor in any segment in the capitalist market today. So, you know, we say, oh, is my competitor, you know, the esteemed Toto or Kohler? Actually, it's also Amazon. Okay, because Amazon can go and, and make OEM toilets for very cheap and sell Amazon Basics toilets for $99. So we have to remember that the world is an incredibly disruptive moment and that disruption is accelerating. So the only way we can actually overcome and really solve some of these big problems we're talking about framed very conveniently and powerfully by the SDGs is actually to work together to forget these definitions and these boundaries and say, who's got solutions to my problems and how can we actually partner? And, and that is what we as a one company in this world anyway, is trying to make happen step by step, be very practical, be very pragmatic and tackle what we think we can. We don't claim to be able to tackle everything, but we, we understand the footprint we create and what we need to do. Um, and I think companies who are doing value washing or green washing or whatever that, you know, those companies are wasting a lot of time because they might as well just do the thing that they, they should be doing anyway. I mean, I know how much work it takes to shift a Titanic like my company and it's not even among the biggest companies in the world. So I, I just wanted to share that because sometimes I think in conversations we try to take a position, but actually we need to we need to draw down these boundaries rather than sort of use them as a way to divide um, because there's not enough time, as Trista says, to tackle these yep. issues. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Um, I'm afraid um, uh, I have been warned to wrap up. <laughs> I cannot wrap up. I already posed <laughs> okay. a, a very bizarre, you know, sort of for me as doing political philosophy, you know, the concept of, public is is just been nagging it's just everything i received it's like how do we think of how do we define this how do we reconstruct it how resurrect it but that's just my um homework okay and uh much of a learning so um first of all um i would like to thank you everybody for bearing with me <laughs> with my uh, very awkward um moderating and uh, so i'll hand it over to you philip to okay Great. So thank you very much, Haruko. And I, I put you in a, in probably the most difficult job of the entire night. So thank you very much for helping to manage all of the different uh, perspectives. And so um, if it's okay, um, and thank you everybody for your presentations. Um, you all added um, pieces of this bigger picture um, that is critical for, I think, everybody here to understand. So it's, it's, all of your perspectives are vital and I'm learning from all of you, um, which is really wonderful. And, and I appreciate it and hope we can continue this discussion. And I've got like three slides to wrap up with if you'll let me just show some slides at the end, <laughs> just to hope to try to get it all uh, under control and to, to finalize everything. So um, basically, no, that's the wrong share. I've, I, so basically, um, we've started this whole thing with how any uh, organization can measure stakeholder value with ethical capitalism. And we've heard a lot about um, from uh, the speakers across the evening um, to achieve the SDGs, the challenges ahead uh, remain significant and real. And we see this is from SAP a report that they published earlier this year. Um, 
too many companies take insufficient action to attain the goals that they state. And so again, there's a lot of talk. And I think what we agreed on tonight is that beyond the talk, there needs to be clear action. And so imagine for a second that we move beyond disclosure to a value challenge. And so the sensitivity that Yoshio was talking about um, based in sort of this Japanese ethical capitalism philosophy um, that looks at all stakeholders uh, as a collective whole and how we actually call out through that good competition, the best from all of us, whether it's public uh, organizations, uh, whether it's private organizations, whether it's individual citizens, forming together. And so imagine that what Jean was pr uh, presenting about the Sato toilet, um, imagine if there's a hundred competitors around there actually challenging back to Lixil to keep improving so that we achieve the SDG around hygiene, around clean water. We, we start to work together to challenge each other to get there. If we've got that framework, um, that, and with the spirit of I'm in power, and I'm using that power to help call out the power and in, increase and improve the power of all of these other stakeholders around me, then I think we've got a winning solution. And so I still remain very positive. I hear all the negatives around us, and I agree that all of this is very serious, but I think that we've got a collective power um, with this spirit and with this philosophy to guide us underneath, to really achieve these things and to, you know, get to the position also that Trista was talking about, um, that larger uh, end goal to bring that 2092 back to something more reasonable. So um, the Value Research Center and the work that I'm doing and the work that all of you are presenting today um, clearly drives home the fact for me that it's time to move beyond talking about value creation to creating it. And to address this, we at the Valley Research Center and many of our colleagues and peers around the world have put a lot of time into creating this analytically tight and rigorous model to fight against Milton Friedman's argument in saying that all of this is just hot air and that we would now like your help with collaborating with us. So we're very fortunate to have the ESG IREC uh, at Osaka University as a key partner. We've got others around the world, University of Bordeaux, University of Lyon. We're looking for many, many others to join with us. So we're looking to get companies serious about eliminating value washing and creating the highest possible levels of value for everyone. The, the point isn't applying this and getting a perfect score, wearing a pin or a badge or a logo, but the purpose is creating real and measurable value for all stakeholders and constantly challenging to create more and more good competition. So with government and policymakers supporting through clear goals, supporting individuals, businesses, communities, and countries to achieve them, I think this public-private issue uh, that Hoshino Sensei was also um, talking about is fundamental to the success. So we hope you'll join us in further developing and improving and implementing this model. We're definitely not there yet, exactly as Kumar uh, was talking about. We need help to keep going. Um, I'd like to offer a special scholarship for journalists. So any journalist out there interested in the value model, I'd like to offer you or through the Value Research Center some free training in a pilot training program this October. Um, so please just reach out and contact me because I think the media also plays a fundamental role and we need more journalists to understand this bigger picture uh, and how it actually plays in the journalism that they do. So um, finally, I'd like to thank everybody on behalf of all of the members of the Value Research Center here in Kyoto, Japan, and globally. Uh, thank you for joining the workshop today. Uh, we continue to look for collaborators. Sato Sensei, Hoshino Sensei, and the SG IREC team are some of them, uh, and we're looking for many more. Uh, partners, members, certified consultants, and trainers in this value model. And I'm personally looking forward to kicking off more and deeper discussions. We've I invited so many people because I'm so excited by all of you and what you think, but we need to start to move forward now to move into collaboration. So please email us uh, or email me at info at valueresearchcenter.com or reach out on LinkedIn. Um, and again, please don't forget to rate our session on the session page for this event uh, on the UN uh, GA Science Summit site. So again, thank you very much. I'll stop my share, turn it back over to Heather and any of you, um, but I'm three minutes past 
past my deadline. Uh, I apologize, but just I've been inspired by all of you and really thank you for um, staying with us for so long. And I look forward to continuing this discussion later. So um, Haruko, or uh, maybe Heather, I can turn it back over to you, or I think that basically um, it's probably time for us to wrap up. So thank you. So hi, we're done. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you.